The year is 2010. The whole world is grooving to the beats of Kesha and the FIFA World Cup is just upon us. These are the years of positivity. There is increasing investor confidence that the world economy will rebound from the horrors of the global financial crisis. Although this recovery looks like it will be a slow one, the free money policies opted for by central banks around the globe have made it easier for companies and normal civilians alike to recover. All in all, the world is in a state of cautious optimism. Nobody really needs or wants any unexpected surprises. On the 6th of May, the Dow Jones had started off the day on a bearish note. Concerns were looming about the debt crisis in the EU, particularly in Greece, and markets were trading around 300 points lower for the day. Then at around 2.32pm, the unthinkable happened. In a span of just 5 minutes, an additional 7% of stock market capitalization disappeared. A trillion dollars worth of US industry vanished into thin air. Exelon Corp is one of the largest and most powerful utilities in the world. Back in 2010, it had a market cap of around 30 billion US dollars. However, for a brief moment on that Thursday, the stock market said that it was completely worthless. Other established companies such as Accenture, the Boston Beer Company and Sotheby's saw such extreme price swings that it put a giant question mark on the entire market structure and society's apparently blind faith on the systems in place. An investigation that preceded this crash revealed that high-frequency trading firms were the reason why close to 10% of the US market value disappeared into thin air. But what are these firms? How are they structured? And what was the environment that led to the flash crash of 245? High frequency trading or HFT is first off a subset of algorithmic trading, a system of stock market trading where the buy and sell decisions are made by computers instead of the usage of a human interface. These algorithms are essentially strategies that have been developed by a group of people with an average IQ of 170. They are highly accurate pieces of code that make their proprietors a lot of money. Since computers have the ability to process information at a rate and with an accuracy that us mortals can barely even fathom, it makes sense that one would want to automate the entire trading process and use these silicon contraptions instead. In fact, it is believed that close to 80% of all trades that occur on the New York Stock Exchange are automated without even the slightest human interaction. When you think about high frequency trading, the first thing that you need to think of is speed and volume. Speed because stocks are bought and sold in the order of microseconds and volume because this is a type of trading that is thought to make up on average 50% of the daily trading volume in the US. Speed in HFT is so important that firms even pay extra to place their systems in the building of the stock market and get access to a direct connection to the exchange's terminal. This is known as co-location. In order to truly understand why HFTs are so dependent on speed for their survival, we need to take a short history lesson. An early example of where speed had an important role to play in stock market trading was back in the 1930s. Back then, trades were made at the physical pits of the stock exchange. Rich industrialists, or at least those who survived the turmoil of the Great Depression, would place their buy and sell orders through telegram. This would then be communicated to the broker on the floor, who would then communicate the order to the pit agent. Sometimes your order might be executed, sometimes it might not, but chaos and shouting were always guaranteed. The way most orders were placed remained largely unchanged until the formation of the Nasdaq in 1971. The Nasdaq revolutionized the game with the help of electronic trading. Time taken to place orders was reduced to just a few seconds and as the technology improved further, big players could place their orders in just a fraction of the time it even takes you to blink an eye. In 2005, the need of the hour was to have a unified market system where buyers and sellers would get the best possible price for their trades. It was during this time that the United States Securities and Exchange Commission or SEC, came and introduced Regulation National Market System, or Reg NMS for short, and competition was encouraged in the market. However, there were also some unintended consequences of Reg NMS. One of these was that by unifying different exchanges across the country, it effectively meant that the person with the quickest access to the data in each market had a chance to react before other investors could even refresh their stock quotes. It was in this environment that those traders with the fastest speed or lowest latency began to thrive. Remember how we mentioned earlier that HFT firms feed on speed? In fact, without speed, HFT algos are just very expensive pieces of proprietary code. Getting the first access to the latest market codes is so important that firms actually spend millions of dollars just to shave off a couple of milliseconds in latency time. Just for your reference, the average blink of an eyelid is somewhere around 100 milliseconds. 
This is why HFT firms actually pay for the right to place their algos on the floor of the stock exchange and spend a bomb on optic fiber cables. So now that we have an abstract idea of what HFT algorithms are and why speed is so important to them, let us take a closer look at what these firms actually do, what their trading strategies are and how do they go about their business. Latency arbitrage is a trading strategy where HFTs use their superior low latency networks to take advantage of the price differences that occur in the market. Due to special privileges such as co-location and super-fast networks, HFTs have access to market information several milliseconds before other retail investors. Assume that you're a trader who wants to buy shares of a company, say Apple, from a person A. When you take a look at your screen, you will see that the current market price is 50.5 and that price is agreeable to you. However, just because you click on the buy icon at your terminal, the market price drops to say 49.5. This new market price will take some time to reach a terminal because retail investors work with high latency internet connections. In the slow and inevitable chaos of the market, you will end up placing your 50.5 bid, theoretically paying a whole dollar more than the current market price. But you'll be surprised to know that when person A takes a look at his balance sheet at the end of the day, he will realize and his broker will tell him so that his Apple stock was sold at 49.5. What happened to that additional $1? What actually happened in the background was something that is a lot simpler than a magical tax. As soon as the current market price updated, a HFT firm C bought shares from A at the quoted $49.5, while at the same time selling you, the retail investor with the old quotes, the same stock at a dollar markup. Out of thin air, HFT firm C has made a dollar without risking a single penny. This is in effect what latency arbitrage is. In a weird way, you can think of the stock market as a row of matches resting one next to the other. At any given point, there are thousands of limit orders just waiting to get triggered. HFT algos recognize this, and what they do in return is that they send thousands of small 100 share buy orders out into the market at a price that is just above the current market price. These orders often show themselves on the retail investor screens and trigger the limit orders that were set by people like you and I. Once this initial jump in market price ignites the first set of limit orders, the prices will continue to go higher, lighting more and more matches until there are no more to burn through. While the price is going up, the HFT trader is riding the momentum, having bought some shares of the manipulated stock before sparking the momentum ignition. Once the market is overbought, the price quickly settles back to its pre-volatility levels. Only this time, the HFT trader is no longer in the picture. He has made his money during the initial spike before the price corrected. Front running refers to the illegal act of entering into a trade anticipating that a big institutional investor will execute a block transaction. Essentially, this refers to scanning the market for any signs that a big order might be coming in. There's a lot of nitty-gritty that goes into front running, but all you need to understand is that the algos put out thousands of small 100 chart orders which are then used to gather information from the rest of the market. If the algo feels like there's actually a big order coming in, then the HFT firm also purchases shares with the intention of selling out once the big investor raises the market levels. Iceberg orders are large single orders that have been divided into smaller orders by placing of an automated program. This is done for the purpose of hiding the actual order quantity. The practice gets its name from the fact that the visible orders are only the tip of the iceberg, given that there is significant amount placed in the form of limit orders. These limit orders are sometimes referred to as reserve orders. High frequency traders identify iceberg orders by recognizing that there is a series of limit orders coming from a single market maker. These algorithms have been trained to recognize a particular type of ordering and can predict to a certain degree of accuracy that a certain block transaction was placed by an institutional firm. Since there is always a very strong support for an iceberg order, HFT firms will look to place an order at current prices and then will scalp profits until the block transaction has been fulfilled. Although momentum ignition and front running are banned by global exchanges, these practices are still widespread in smaller firms and cannot be fully eradicated. HFT firms are constantly researching and looking for ways to be one step ahead of the regulators. So, you might be wondering now, hey Mr. Indian guy, I get what you're saying and all, but how does all of this concern me? If it is only the big investors who are the target of these firms, then why should I be bothered? Well, that's why you'd be wrong. Most of these institutional investors are mutual funds, pension funds, and other places where regular people like you and I set aside our money for retirement. Every dollar that a HFT firm makes using strategies such as latency arbitrage is a dollar that could have instead been put into someone's retirement savings. 
Another reason why HFT should make you feel uneasy is because events like the crash of 245 increase the amount of volatility in the marketplace. Over a short term, this means that all of your trades and investments inherently become more and more risky. Finally, the last point to consider is what kind of service do these firms even offer to a competitive marketplace? Yes, it is true that since these firms became widespread, there have been fewer and fewer arbitrage opportunities across exchanges, and all in all, the stock market has become far more efficient. But why do other investors need to pay for this increased efficiency? Efficiency should be a characteristic that arrives as the result of the maturity of a market, not because investors like you and I are paying for it. The reason that the flash crash of 245 was overly exaggerated was because when prices started going down, HFT firms began to dump their holdings so as to decrease the amount of risk they were exposed to. When the market needed them the most to supply it with liquidity, that is when they existed it, leaving no support on prices and incredible amounts of volatility that caused nearly 10% of the world's largest economy to disappear into thin air. A few weeks ago, I just happened to dip my hands into video editing on Resolve and somehow I renewed my passion for storytelling. What do you think happened when I combined these two newly acquired skills with my burgeoning love for finance and economics? Filter Coffee Finance was born. Through this YouTube channel, I hope that I will be able to paint seemingly complicated finance topics in as plain and simple a light as possible. It is my sincere hope that through each video I can break down the muddled and confusing walls of finance for everyone who comes across this channel. Now that I've finally managed to get my first video out there, I can't wait to become more regular and to turn this into a monthly or even a weekly upload. I'm sure that with your support and encouragement, we can grow this channel into a community that is united by our love for anything related to finance. If you have any suggestions or tips that you would like to see in the next video, please feel free to add your comments below. If not, keep smiling and until we meet again, this is Filter Coffee Finance signing off.